Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody, to BC310, a course on church and ministry administration. Thank you all for joining the class today. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll get started. Could somebody lead us in prayer, please. Can I pray, Pastor? Yes, Asha, go ahead, please. Dear God, thank you so much for your loving kindness. Thank you for pouring out every day a new breath of air in our lungs, God. Thank you so much, Lord, as we're about to learn about CME, Lord, that we may understand more and pour out wisdom in us, God. And I pray that as Pastor is about to teach us, Lord, that we may grasp the truths and apply in our heart, that we may not just listen to it, but to be the doers of it, God. Thank you for your loving uh, kindness and I pray for each one of the students that they will have a blessed day. Thank you for everything, Lord. We make you pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, once again, good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, the class. We are uh, talking about we are talking about church and ministry administration. And last week, we started talking about um, culture. We uh, started getting into the topic, and we had some interesting discussions. So we're going to continue on that. Um, the plan today is, um, yeah, we'll do that in the first hour. And in our second hour, I'll, I'll stop the class a little early, maybe around 10.30 or 10.40. Uh, I need to, uh, basically I need to go to the airport after that and then uh, and go to Delhi. I have a conference in Delhi. Um, so this evening uh, I'll be speaking at a pastor's conference, so need to get there. Then tomorrow we have a, um, two sessions in a youth conference and I get back. So um, just in the second hour, we'll finish a little early. Uh, maybe I will pause a little early, maybe around 10 30, latest 10 40. So that'll give me a little bit of time to um, head out. Okay, so that's the plan. And um, let's get started. I'll um, share the course notes now on uh, culture. So we started talking about this last week. And uh, in any organization, so uh, uh, when we specifically look at church uh, or a Christian ministry, uh, let's talk about the church first. We have culture that is within the church as an organization, that means the staff and the people who are working, so that we will refer to that as the workplace culture of that church. But we also have culture of the community, the congregation, you know, so uh, uh, the people who are gathering together or worshiping together, there is a certain culture that is formed over time, of course. And so we need to be sensitive to both. Now, if you look at a Christian organization, uh, there is the culture of that organization, the Christian organization, how people work together, etc. And uh, that will, in some way, or in, you know, in, in, in a very quiet way, but it'll definitely impact the kind of ministry that comes out of that organization, you know, and the work they do. Uh, it, it, I'm talking about organiza Christian organizations that are not, not a church organization, but a general Christian organization. So we need to be sensitive. Uh, and pay attention to the culture. Now, culture um, of an organization can be intentionally forged. That means you can intentionally, if you're careful, you, you can carefully, intentionally shape the culture of an organization. Now, uh, sometimes people don't think about it, and so what happens, it's more of an accidental thing. It just happens, and then if you end up with a very bad, and we will talk about it, a very, you know, uh, a toxic culture or a culture that is not 
optimal, then a lot of wrong things can happen uh, simply because of the kind of culture that was formed, sometimes even accidentally, uh, in the organization or in the church community. So it is always better to intentionally shape the culture of the organization and also the congregation. Right? It can be intentionally shaped and we must understand you know, what goes into shaping the culture of the organization. So uh, just to review some of the things we already spoke about last week, when we talk about culture, we're talking about jointly held beliefs. We're talking about these values and practices that uh, that is kind of held within the organization. It uh, refers to also the way of behaving and thinking. What are the norms? This is the way you normally behave, and this is the way we normally look at things, perspectives, our worldviews, our paradigms, you know, our frameworks. And uh, it's also referring to the way things are done. This is how we do things here, you know. So culture can be, you know, uh, addressed or uh, explained in many of these ways. Now, in a very large organization, there will, of course, be subcultures. That means, you know, uh, while there is an overarching culture of the organization, within each department, there could be slight variations. There could be slight, uh, you know, localizations of culture. Of course, you know, especially when it extends geographically, um, the expression of culture within that global organization would vary regionally, of course. So we must be mindful of that as well, that just because an organization claims a certain culture, it is not necessarily universal. Within that organization, you will find variations uh, in the expressions of culture, and sometimes the subcultures themselves could be very different from the parent organization. And then that then there could be a real clash and problems happen even in that context. But anyway, we are looking more from a Christian church organization, and uh, let's see how you know we could go about this. Now, why is talking about culture important? Because when you, when you look at it yeah, from a Christian organization perspective, it will affect a lot of things. And I've just mentioned a few here. Uh, it, it affects the employee experience, the people who are working, the church staff, their experience in the organization, which therefore affects productivity and therefore affects how people are served. And uh, the culture uh, is something like an immune system. It can protect the organization. You know, so when there is something that comes in that is contrary to the established culture, there is an automatic response of rejecting negative influences. You know, so we say, you know, that kind of action or that kind of behavior is not tolerated in this environment because this environment has already has a very good culture in, in, in that sense. So it can work as an immune system to reject uh, wrong influences. So very important for us to understand is how is organization culture shaped or how is the culture of the congregation shaped? We must understand that, uh, especially those of us in Christian ministry. You know, either you're going to you're going to run an organization, Christian organization, or you're going to, you know, be pastoring a congregation, a church, and you need to understand how is the culture going to be shaped, and therefore I am I should be very intentional about creating this culture. Remember, culture is is shaped and formed over time. You know, it doesn't happen in one day. It is something that you do over time that eventually will shape the culture. And then, of course, you know, we will need to refine, we need to change or correct. Sometimes we need to correct the culture. And I will, I will share some examples of that as we go along. So we were talking about this um, last week, that leadership is so important because the leadership, it all starts here. They, if the leadership models the behavior, the, lead, the leadership 
in many ways embodies the culture especially when you are starting out and or in a pastoral type of thing you know people look at the leader they follow the leader so or the leaders the leadership so we have to start with the leaders the leadership and say this is the kind of culture we want to create therefore we are the first people who are going to embody this culture then people are going to see us and they're going to follow that we will reproduce after our own kind that's a law you see so we have to be that if you want to create that culture in our organization or in the church congregation so we will mention you know uh, what are the good qualities that leaders must embody but we were talking about last time you know servant servanthood how can you create an organization where everybody has the heart of a servant a willing they serve willingly they're not looking for status they're not looking for power and position you know and sometimes uh, uh, is, uh you know in the corporate world position um, status role power influence all those things are important because then you can control you can direct you can do this now, when people move into a church context, they come with that background. They are thinking in terms of, oh, I need to have a role. I need to have a position. I, I need to have, uh, you know, a certain status. And so we, we have to help them unlearn that and say, no, 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 no. In the Christian organization or in the church context, those are negatives. You know, while they may work in the corporate culture, in the church culture those are negatives we don't think like that we don't think in terms of role position status you know uh, uh, that is not important at all here we have to think in terms of serving anonymity uh, 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 don't worry if you're not recognized your reward comes from god recognition is not in, in uh, priority um, so the culture the leadership culture uh, is kind of reversed when compared to the way things are done, you know, generally speaking, in the world or in the corporate. So many of us have, you know, we move from the corporate into the church, um, and then we have to unlearn, we have to relearn what is priority as a leader and in leadership you know uh, that you 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 move in a different way uh, as a leader so that's something you know I, i've also noticed and uh, sometimes even among volunteers i find you know when you know of course you know in, in the church congregation we have people have all kinds of people serving and sometimes I, I see that you know when people are coming from the corporate background they're very pushy with their ideas you know they're very forceful with their ideas and i need to push back in, in a gentle way saying yeah we respect ideas but it's not going to work here the way it works in the corporate meaning you cannot push your ideas you can't be very forceful in your ideas there is a different way we go about working here you know kind of so i need to very gently push back uh, when I see, and I'm not saying everybody's like this, I'm just saying generally, uh, when sometimes people come from that perspective, they're very forceful with their ideas and push back. Sometimes uh, people automatically want the role first, they want the status first, they want the recognition first. And I say, no, 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 first you serve, you know, and then at the right time, the role will be given. You know, so it works the other way. You first serve, you prove yourself, be willing, be a willing servant, and then comes the role and the recognition, whatever you know, as opposed to the way it may happen in another context. So um, that's very important. You know, learning how a leadership has has to model this uh, in the Christian church or organization, so that from there things can happen you know and then within our pastoral team i sometimes i have to correct our own pastors say, hey no don't do that don't do it like that because if if one of our pastors behaves in a certain way people watching that person will start imitating that and they will begin to imbibe a wrong attitude or a wrong 
culture, you know. So I need to correct them and say, no, no, don't do it like that. Be kind, be gentle, you know, and things like in, in how communication is done and so on. Uh, I need to just say, hey, do it differently. So these are uh, these are done intentionally because you understand the importance of leaders. That if 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 leaders don't model it, or if leaders model the wrong culture, a wrong attitude, wrong practice, wrong behavior, people are going to imbibe that, and then undoing that is is uh, very very difficult. So overall. You know, we need to, uh, as leaders, be exemplary in our behavior. Because, you know, the way and the scripture that comes to my mind is First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, where Paul writes to Timothy and he says, be an example. So he's, he's talking to Timothy. Timothy is the pastor, the leader of the congregation in Ephesus, and Ephesus is a very influential church because it not only is influencing Ephesus, it's influencing all the other churches in that region who are in the vicinity. It's a very influential church, and Timothy is in charge of it. And Paul tells Timothy, be an example of the believers you know, in word, uh, in, in, in conversation, in faith, in love, in purity. In all of these things, so that nobody can look down on your youth. You know, nobody can look down on you just because you're young. But even though you're young, you be exemplary. You know that way, your youth cannot be held against you because people see that you are exemplary in the way you, you know, in all of these things as a believer. So as leaders, we must be exemplary. And uh, I, um, you know, I'm just thinking whether to share. A particular testimony or not because uh, I don't want to you know I don't want to but let me say this in a very brief way I've had to dismiss certain leaders because of this reason you know uh, when one of our own leaders you know and I'm and I'm working with them and I say leaders means pastors in the church or leaders people are leading ministries um, when we are working together, it's very important that we embody this culture. And suppose, you know, and I have, and this has happened, I just don't want to get into the details, but you know, I, I work with this leader and I and I notice that things are wrong. They're the way the what they're doing, the way they, they conduct basically, the way they're conducting themselves is not what we want to have at APC. Right? The, the, the kind of exemplary leadership, because we expect our leaders to be exemplary. We've got to set it, we've got to model it. But if a leader is not doing then I talk to them. I say, okay, you know, look, this is not the way to conduct ourselves. This is not the way to do it. And I'm not talking about, you know, quote unquote, sinful things. No, the, they're not doing sinful things. It's just that the conduct is not exemplary. And therefore, it is affecting the people who are, whom they are leading. And the people whom they are leading are beginning to um, follow their conduct, which is not acceptable uh, the way we want it. So, you know, after repeated discussions, and you know, uh, if, if that doesn't change, then I have to tell them to step down, uh, release them from that particular role, leadership role, so on and so forth. And I've done that, you know, and uh, it is painful uh, when you have to do that at this level, at the level of a pastor, leader. It's painful for the individual, it's painful for the people following the, that person or that individual. But you are looking at what is happening that their, their, their conduct is not what we want to embody as a church and in the congregation. So it's not like they're sinning, it's just that it's out of line. It's, it's not exemplary. It's not the right kind of behavior that we want in the organization. And so 
even though after repeated discussions and feedback and correction, if that doesn't change, then uh, you know I've had to do that on a couple of occasions. So now people may not understand the importance. Hey, this person didn't sin, some grievous sin. That is true. But people need to understand the culture we are trying to create in the organization because culture eventually affects everybody. It affects everything that happens. It affects how lives are formed and shaped in the long run. And that's why this is important. Okay, so let me pause here uh, uh, for any questions before I go on to the next point. So leadership uh, is very important here in shaping culture. Any Any other thoughts? Any, sorry, any questions on that? All okay? The class is very quiet today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Louis, please go ahead with your question. Good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, I, I had a meeting with um, a, um, a church um, office office staff, and they had some concerns uh, in the regarding not being heard when it comes to ideas and um, um, things they feel that they can bring to the table. You know, so. At what point do you balance the rigidity of the leader versus the acceptability of ideas? Because um, it, it's a kind of recurring decimal in, in um, especially in a church space where the leader seems to want to have all the ideas and the people are just supposed to just come in and function under the ideas because they seem to be like quote unquote from God. And the people just, you know, have to follow through. At, at what point do we set that that balance, especially when you're creating a culture and you're mm. expecting people to buy into the vision? Sometimes they cannot have an input into the quote unquote the success of the of the vision. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Very good question. So, so the question is. You know, um, what Louis is asking is, so there's a leader, uh, it could be a pastor or the leader of the Christian organization, and then you have all the other people who are working together. And, uh, you know, we, let's just call them church staff, and they are expressing ideas. And uh, how, and if the leader is not necessarily, you know, welcoming those ideas or being open to those ideas, but it's all, Unidirectional, I and mean, we refer to that as unilateral. You know, it's coming from the leader to the pe to the staff, uh, and it's you know it's it's just unilateral. It's coming from one way, or it's just one way, and then the the staff are just expected to carry out whatever it happens. Now, uh, that is not a healthy culture. It's not a healthy environment. Uh, the change that has to happen is in the heart of the leader, right? It's in, it has to happen in the heart of the leader. The leader has to be open to, first of all, willing to let people share their ideas. You know, okay, let's have a discussion. So one of the things that we must learn to do as leaders is, to give people the opportunity to express their ideas, especially if it is, you know, it's, it's the, the 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 team. You know, of course, you have a congreg. If you're in a church, you have a congregation that are many hundreds, maybe sometimes thousands of people. Uh, you can't sit and listen to every idea, but we can always, given technology today, we can always give people the opportunity to share their ideas. You know, whether they do it or not, it's up to them. But at least you're giving the opportunity. Now, definitely at the organization level, within the organization, with all the people working, uh, we should at least give them the opportunity to share their ideas. We're not saying we're going to do every idea because we cannot. 
uh, there may be many good ideas, but uh, you know there are other factors to think about: time and resources and uh, all those kinds of things. But at least people can share their ideas, express their ideas. So that opportunity should be given, and that should come from the leader or leadership, right? And that's a very important part of culture. You know, the willingness, the ability to for the the uh, let's say the opportunity for discussion, the opportunity to share ideas. Um, people can express that idea. It doesn't mean everything is going to be implemented, but at least everything people can share. And a good leader is able to listen to all these ideas and then put them together and then see you know what are the ones that can be executed what are the ones you know we prioritize them and then say okay you know let's work on these in this order so on so forth. that of course the leader or the leadership team can do that but at least people should be given the opportunity to express the idea now there are situations like Louis is sharing where uh, the leader or the leadership doesn't even think like that. They only think about, I will pray, I will seek God, I will get the ideas, and I will tell you what to do and you do it. That's very unidirectional. It's not a healthy environment. And it also means the people who are working and serving don't have a voice. And the chances of going wrong is very high because if the leader has a wrong idea or a bad idea, nobody's there to say, hey, that idea is not good, you know. And uh, 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 there are no checks and balances, and so it's very dangerous. The And uh, can the congregation or can the team how can the team effect change? Well, I think uh, in a very respectful way, uh, those who have some access to the leader uh, or to the leadership can propose saying, and of course we have to put, do it in a nice way, we have to put it out in a nice way, can we have a discussion on this? You know something. Uh, a decision is being made, and say, so, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, whoever pastor or whoever it is, you know, thank you for sharing. But pastor, can we have a little discussion with, you know, uh, the rest of the team about this? So what we're doing is, we are introducing the leader to the idea of discussion. We're introducing the leader, or we're requesting the leader, saying, hey, why don't we do, you know, or Technically, they call it brainstorming. Why don't we brainstorm? Why don't we share ideas? You know, so if we can put that forward to the leader in a, in a, in a nice way, we're not doing it in a disrespectful way. But if somebody who, you know, who is close to the leader can say, hey, why don't we get, you know, the five people, the 10 people uh, who are part of the staff, and why don't we all discuss on this? And that way, one, we can open ourselves to more ideas. God can speak through anyone. The Holy Spirit can give creative ideas to many different people. Second, um, it automatically gets ownership. That means when people are contributing, when people are brainstorming together, they take collective ownership. So half our motivation issues are taken care of because they have contributed to the idea they are they own the idea or ideas that have been shared and so they are willing to go ahead and do it right so you have um, um, you know a discussion or a brainstorming whatever you want to call it a session so you, we can suggest that to the to the leader saying pastor you know we are planning you know we are planning this I don't know event or conference or decision uh, can we get five people together to discuss about it to share ideas to discuss can we do that so if the the, the password leader is introduced to the idea of discussion of brainstorming 
uh, then they will begin to realize that that is a much better way to make decisions. Now, uh, uh, the other things, you know, from a leadership perspective, we would think about is, see, there are times a leader has to be decisive, you know, when saying, okay, we are going to go ahead and do this. And uh, uh, so as a leader, you should know when that kind of an action is necessary, right? When you're saying, look, we are going to go ahead with this, you know, a new idea. Um, now, some of that, especially in the early stages of the ministry, would be required because you may not have that much, many people on the team or the team itself will be inexperienced. The team may not have the big picture understanding. And in those situations, the leader has to be more decisive and say, we're going to go ahead with this. Let's go ahead. Let's start. So on. Um, or there are times when a lot of ideas have been shared, a lot of good ideas. Now it's the leader's responsibility to, you know, sift through all the good ideas and then decide, or the leadership team, they got to sift through all the ideas and say, okay, you know, we've got 20 good ideas. All of them are good, but we can't do all 20. We need to pick two. Well, that's where the leader has to be decisive and say, okay, these are the two I, you know, things we are going to do uh, because of these reasons. You know, maybe they are the ones that are very aligned to where we are going, or they're the ones that we can readily do and we can take action, so on and so forth. So there are times when the leader has to be decisive. Like I said, early, either in the initial stages or at times when there are a lot of good ideas and you have to pick something, you have to you know pick one or two ideas. But I think the what's important is the process. When we have an open process, that is a, a, a way of doing things where people can be part of it, they can share their ideas, they can discuss, they can ask questions, they are not afraid to do that. That is a very healthy culture. It's a very healthy environment. So say, I know you dropped off in between, but I hope you got what we said. And, uh, um, yes, I, I, I got it. I got it. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? We were talking about how leadership affects culture. Any other thoughts anybody wants to share on that? experiences, etc. Okay. All right. Um, then let's move on to the next point. How so how is culture within the organization or within the church community shaped? First he said the leadership has to model it. And we're putting a lot of responsibility on the leadership, I understand. But that's the fact of the matter that, um, you know, uh, culture flows from there, uh, from the leadership. And then uh, when you think about a large organization, we will be then referring to leadership at all levels because leadership at every level influences the culture of the people directly under them right so we have as a leader you also have to look out at how other leaders under you are doing because you understand that their conduct their behavior is shaping the culture of the people under them and that's very important because the people under them may not be directly influenced by your culture maybe to some extent but more so by the people immediately over them. And so you have to watch over um, the culture of uh, leaders beneath, underneath you whom you are leading. And so that's very important. Let's go to the next point. I, I, I hope I didn't spend too much time on this, but uh, that's, it's, it's very important. Some of the things, other things that generally affect culture, and we can go through this rather quickly, is when we share stories. Stories of, uh, you know, how things began, stories of, you know, past victories, of how various situations were overcome, 
as these stories are told and retold, they inspire, they shape, they guide behavior within the organization. So stories, uh, are, are, you know, they capture the imagination of people, especially stories of the organization's own journey, right? Or people within the organization, their journey. Those stories are very, very powerful in shaping culture. So uh, uh, at different points, if we have, you know, if we are very thoughtful, uh, we can introduce these stories, and in a very thoughtful way, very intentional way, have these stories shared, uh, whether from the leaders or others who've been part of the organization. And as they sh share their stories, you know, it is really powerful. It really captures the imagination of people and helps shape, guide, and uh, the behavior in the organization. So stories are very powerful. However, on in the Christian context, these stories can also be very dangerous. Somehow, especially when you're talking about the leadership, when the leaders have very unique stories, then it becomes dangerous to focus on them because it puts that leader in a pedestal. So for example, you know, and this happens, and this has been happening over and over again, and so let me explain that. So for example, if a leader says, you know, uh, when I was, you know, whatever, when I was seeking God and the Lord Jesus appeared to me, three times on three consecutive days and he put his right hand on me and you know I had this great experience and for 48 hours I was under the anointing and whatever you know the, the leader has such an amazing story and then you know then he says after that I began my ministry and today the ministry you know so what happens when a leader shares that kind of a story on the one hand it is very it is very, very powerful, but on the other hand, it, it is very negative. So why do you say it's negative? Because now everything in that organization is predicated on that leader's experience. So everybody, if the leader keeps on repeating that story, which is a true story, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's not, it, 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 let's say it's, it is a true story and he had such an experience and all that, wonderful. But if the leader keeps repeating that particular story or you know those kinds of stories, everybody is then being built on that particular leader's experience, which is a very dangerous thing. People need to be established in the Word of God and in the Spirit of God themselves, not on a leader's story or experience you know they say we are part of this church because this leader had such a great experience or you know this ministry is there because of this leader so what happens when the leader dies you know what happens when the leader goes off the scene for whatever reason and that story becomes invalidated and therefore everybody in the organization everybody in the congregation the feel invalidated because that story is gone so that's the danger. So what we must do is, we must intentionally share stories that are commonplace, that show how God works in the lives of our day-to-day -day situations, how the Word of God is applied to our day-to-day -day lives, and how people in the congregation, their stories, rather than just the leader's own personal story. I mean, I'm not saying the leader should never share this, share this story. They should share. But the focus and the emphasis should not be on those leadership stories alone. It's important, but it should be downplayed. And the stories that are spoken of are stories of how lives, people's lives, have been shaped, or how God has worked in the ordinary situations of life. So when we share those kinds of stories, what happens is we are saying God is working in all of our lives. God is working 
in ordinary people. And the focus does, doesn't become on the leader's personal experiences. It is true, the leader may have had amazing personal experiences. Many leaders have had that. And that's why they started their ministries, of course. But the focus should not be on those stories. It should be on stories of people. And those stories should be told and retold, or the stories of the journey of the community, of the church, or the organization. Those stories, those victories need to be told and retold. So the focus is not on the leader, or on the supernatural experience of one individual, but it's on the community. And those stories become very, those stories become very, very powerful to shape the culture. The people understand God is at work. We expect God to work. We expect God to do these things. And you know, then they they, they journey forward with that. Any questions on that? We are we understand that. Christopher, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, just so I thank you, Pastor. I, you know, just to add an uh, additional comment, uh, which uh, you may have mentioned also, is uh, I think also within or I mean, when those stories are uh, are uh, sort of uh, you know uh, made a lot bigger than maybe then, and people take it to heart, it also impacts the pastor themselves or the person who is you know the story is about because uh, you know, an aura is sort of created around that uh, that person. And uh, uh, sometimes that can lead to, as you said, you know, something dangerous um, happens where the person it goes to that person's head, and uh, you know this, they may even fall, and you know then they sort of kind of um, may even you know, cover up uh, uh, whatever their uh, you know their wrong deeds are, and uh, it just creates a it's a lot of uh, uh, you know I think pride comes into the, into the picture, and um, um, in my sort of um, uh, sort of view, I think you know Jesus is probably the best example of it. You know where he, he did have such a great influence and great impact on you know on that um, on which territory he was in, and um, you know did miracles, healed people. But I think at the end of the day, he was you know there was so much of humility, and and also I think he also realized that you know at the at the end, he would be he would be shamed. He would be, uh, you know, pe by people, and uh, you know, he would actually uh, give up his life for us. So, um, yeah, just thought I'd just add that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Very good. Anybody else? Any other thoughts on stories that shape the organization, the culture? Yeah. So. We need to create room to, for these stories to be shared. Uh, one is, of course, you know, simple thing as testimonies. People can email testimonies, share testimonies, so on. That's a simple thing. But at the same time, you highlight certain things, uh, you know, major victories that, that God has led the church or the organization through, or uh, major things that you've been able to do together, major obstacles you've overcome, etc. You know, So those things really capture the minds and imaginations of people. And it has to be done properly uh, without focus on an individual, a leader, or so on. Okay. Now, the third thing that shapes the culture, uh, let's do one more before the break, are uh, Rituals and practices that are repeated consistently. So you know, you, you say like this is these are things we do, or this is the way we do things. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, when a person is leaving the organization, for and, uh, let me say this is what we do at APC. Uh, when one of our church staff uh, somebody's worked with us, uh, they're leaving. What we do is we uh, have a little get together on their last day. We will have some cake and snacks. It's like almost like a little farewell party where, uh, you know, we have this, we all get together in the office, we have cakes and snacks, and then we let that person talk and say, hey, how was your experience in? the organization, what are you going to do next, etc. 
and then we pray for that person, we bless them, and we send them out. So while you know, when a person leaves, it's not a nice thing. You know, uh, you feel sad. You wonder, like, hey, what could we have done to keep that person with us? Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, and it does affect the morale of people a little bit. You know, because somebody who's work, been working, especially if they've been working with us, and I've, some people have been working with us for a long time. You know, more than 10, 15 years, and um, this they're still with us, and that's wonderful. But then there are some people who may work with us for two years and then two, three years, and then they may move on, things like that. Uh, so that is never a, a, a pleasant moment. You know, it is, for all of us, it's like, okay, I wish they stayed. Why are they moving? What did, did we do something wrong, etc. So many things. But if we can do something positive, even in that kind of a moment, uh, you know, everybody feels good about it. And so this is something we've been practicing. So it's a ritual, it's a practice that we do, right? Okay, people leave uh, who are working with us, they leave for various reasons. You know, they may have found a better opportunity or um, they may be moving out of town, they may be wanting to do something different in the ministry. Many of them leave because they want to start their own ministries, churches, etc. so on, so many reasons. But then on their last day, when we make it a, it's a ritual, it's a practice that we're going to have a little farewell. We don't call it a farewell party, we just get together. We have snacks together, we, you know, we pray, we let them share, they talk about their experience, they talk about what they're gonna do. And we pray for them. So we make it a positive, as positive as we can, we make it a positive moment, even though it is a difficult uh, moment. Somebody's leaving the organization. So this is a ritual, there's a practice, and it's always, it's been repeated, I know, we've been, I don't know how many years now, we've been doing it over and over, over again, whenever people leave. So the net result is, we think, we look at, that as a positive thing, right? We bless them. Even if they are leaving, we bless them and we send them with our blessing. Now, if people have left for so many reasons, they go abroad, uh, they go to do higher studies, so on and so forth. Uh, things like that. So different, different things you can think about, uh, rituals and practices. Some other quick things I'll just mention is every year we do a volunteer appreciation day. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll mention that in the point number E, uh, where you know we we affirm them, we say thank you, you know, and uh, for all our volunteers, we give them a little gift uh, every year. So then it's like saying, hey, we really appreciate what you're doing. You know, we don't take it for granted because volunteers are serving throughout the year. So these are things we do uh, to affirm uh, affirm the. Uh, volunteers. Okay, let me take a question here. Kennedy, you have a question? Please go ahead. Yes, I just to add something. Where, where we celebrate transition, as in from the under school, when we go to the youth, when we go to the young people, someone is in the baby. So it's more of our culture that bounds us to do it. Okay, uh, Kennedy, I, I I didn't get everything you said, but I think what you said was no, no, what I was saying eh, is when this transition as as in from the Sunday school to the youth, mm -hmm. you see the bit of the transition. Mm -hmm. from the youth to the young professionals, their system is a little bit and they grow up the adults. adults. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's a that's a really good thing to do, and I think it's something we should try doing. Uh, we don't do that, uh, but it's a very good idea, you know. Like when people are coming out of children's church to the youth, to the teens, or the teens to the youth, and the youth to the adults, you celebrate those transitions. That's excellent. That's very good. I think it's something we could learn. Uh, I will try to suggest that to our to our team and see if they want to do it. Oh, good idea. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll go for our quick break. And as I mentioned, 
Um, in our second hour, I'll uh, have to stop uh, a little early, uh, maybe around 10.30, maybe 10.40 max, um, because after that I just need to get to the airport um, and then heading off to Delhi today evening, um, speaking to at a pastor's conference. And then tomorrow there are two sessions with the youth conference. So we'll stop a little early in our second session so I can just head out. Okay, so we'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll continue this. Thank you. <laughs>